Do we have any season finale cliffhangers? We are live. We are live. Dot com. <sighs> That's amazing, Mark. Thanks. Look, it's just floating in the air. E.T. was just here. And he just made it float? He did, yeah, but then he had to go to the bathroom, so... <laughs> Well, the back isn't so fun. You know what? That's the one thing in the movie you never see the back. Yeah. It's those it's something. <laughs> By the way, that. let's just uh talk about what's going to be given away tonight first things. For sure. Uh someone's going to win a tri pack of Atari cartridges that Howard Scott Warshaw worked on. So you get Raiders of the Lost Ark. You get uh-huh. Yar's Revenge. Nice. You get E.T., the extraterrestrial. Or as my mom calls it, et. Yeah. Uh, That's weird, actually. Thank you. It's a little (laughs) odd. But, you know. I've never met your mom. That could be arranged. (laughs) Nice. (laughs) Remember when I asked your mom to prom? Shut up, Ted. <laughs> I know immediately what you're saying. Did you see the? Uh, you, I think we we brought this up last week. What's that? Did you see the new Bill and Ted movie? I have not. I uh, ah. I was going to buy it, but I have, and I've, I've heard it's getting good reviews. Oh yeah. So that's cool. It's excellent. Ex- uh, it's excellent. I, I yep. did rewatch the original. You you mm-hmm. did. Yeah. Huh. I, I, I was sitting here doing some solid work sketching the other night. I'm like, I should put this on so I actually remember what's going all, on. Yeah. Before I watch the new one. Do you one. need to watch both of them or just the first one? To to understand everything that's going on in the in the third one. Eh. Eh. Do you even need yeah, to watch for the first sure. two? They make references to the other two. More so than they did in the the second one. They almost didn't even have time travel in the second one. Oh. Put them in the Iron Maiden. Excellent. Bogus. Execute them. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, so we have a show tonight. Yeah. No? Yeah. Oh, we got some it's chatters good. out there. Let's say hi to the chatters. Hello hey, to chatters. the chatters. Metropolis already complimented your hair. Well, thank you. He, he just cut it. I cut it this morning. Wow. Yep, I no longer need a stylist. I, I'm pretty <laughs> happy pretty about awesome. that. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I have no idea. Oh, I, I I am very demanding of my stylist. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was talking to Howard Scott Warshaw yesterday <clears throat> on the phone, and I, and I had my arcade radio hat on because I didn't have time to do anything. My hair was like totally bedhead from like three days of not showering and not doing my hair. And so he goes, hey, oh, that's a cool arcade radio hat you have there. I'm like, yeah, just trying to, you know, didn't have time to do anything with my hair. And he goes, neither did I. <laughs> uh, <laughs> He's a good guy. It'll be fun to have him on. For those of you who don't know, the guy on the right, in the lower left-hand corner of the screen, uh, of those two men that are standing there with the shaking hands, and they aren't just holding hands in the middle. That's a cartridge. That's an Atari cartridge not in the cartridge yet. It's a prototype. Oh, wow. So, um, but anyway, the guy on the right there is Howard Scott Warsha. He's aged a bit. He doesn't code anymore, but he decided to come on the show. So that'll be fun. Yes. I think we should play a commercial, get everybody in the mood. Yeah. Yeah. I like commercials. Let's play a commercial. Get me in the mood. I usually skip those. I'm going to play uh, this one for everybody. Uh, hang on to your hats. Okay.
Atari. Made cool. especially for systems from Atari. The video game that lets you help E.T. get home. Just in time for Christmas. Happy Holidays from Atari. I feel like we probably should have done that for Christmas. That's you know? true. Oh, that would have been good. Well, Christmas is coming. We can do it again. Maybe we can get him to come on the Christmas show. Huh. <laughs> we, he'll probably talk about everything tonight, though. Right. Well, let's... I, you know, let's hit it. Okay. Live from KOIR Studios in Minneapolis, Minnesota, this is Arcade Radio. <laughs> Commander. Computer reporting. Intruder alert. You might wonder if we're going to change the intro for season five, but we'll find out then. Hello and thanks for listening from the Arcadosphere. This is season four, episode 36 of the Arcade Radio podcast and the season four finale. Today is Thursday, September 10th, 2020, and the time is now approximately 7.22 p.m. Central. I'm your host, Adam Silent Running. I'm joined by my co-host, Mark. I painted a white line on my way straight over here at Shields. And Paradise Arcade <laughs> Shop proprietor and wide-eyed scientist, Brian Thurston Owl Armitage the third, And joining us tonight at 8 o'clock is an accomplished producer, author, psychotherapist, and former game designer. Designer, 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 designer. He designed and programmed... Oh, Adam Mark. broke. <laughs> <laughs> he designed a program oh, for crying out loud. I'm trying to get through my intro here. It's a season finale. Welcome to the show. <laughs> he designed oh, you've ruined it. <laughs> All right. Thanks for playing, everybody. Uh, fill out your forms, and uh, we'll see you next year. So he designed and programmed Yars Revenge, Raiders of the Lost Ark, and E.T. for the Atari VCS. Please uh, welcome in, uh, in a very few minutes, uh Howard Scott Warshaw will be on the show. So, everybody, welcome to the show. This is Arcade Radio. And what have you been working on, Mark? Okay, so, I'm almost done reenacting scenes from Back to the Future. I got <laughs> one more. I thought I was done, and then they were like, you know, they had a lot of slackers. Oh, God. And they did not turn in their scenes. So now I have to do the scene where Doc... Uh, tells Marty, "Look, we'll send you back at the exact time you left." Okay. And then, and then, uh, and then Marty has to you put the coordinates in, the in here. Right. So, so I'm going to do this 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 time where my wife will dress up as Marty. Okay. And I and I'll be Doc. Oh. And and we have like a little photo we're going to hold up where uh, my head is on Doc's. I mean, on Marty's brother and sister. And my wife's head is on Marty, like, you know, because he has to, like, see the picture sure. because yeah. my, my dad laid out Biff in one punch. He's never stood up to Biff in his life. I have all the lines memorized now. Anyway, so I got to do that um, My uh, in arcade news. <laughs> I'm going to my... kick I Am the Gleek and, and Andy Baldwin out now. What the hell's oh, going on in the, in, in the chat? I mean, seriously, <laughs> let's not argue about whether or not we should have a season. Just listen to the show. We're having a great time. You guys, don't make me call you out in the chat. I don't read the chat, so that's interesting. <laughs> um, so in arcade news, my Atari Gauntlet is my next uh, project. I've now decided since I have all the stuff and I've ordered from my back alley. Wait a minute. Hold on. I actually wrote this, wrote this down. I ordered some replacement parts from one of the internet pariahs that you're not supposed to talk about. 
the back alley guys of the arcade world with their black market replacement parts made out of pinball machine machines and children. Anyway, yeah. So that's what I'm going to be doing. That's weird. And also and tomorrow- you get my my Miss Pac-Man on a pallet. Yes. And- well, I, I had to pull it off uh, because I couldn't take it and it was going to rain. So, oh. uh, Actually, I, I'm bringing it with the pallet and then I'm you know going to mount it and strap it and block it okay. and wrap it. All right, man. I appreciate that. Hey, no problem. As soon as, as soon as possible. Probably tomorrow. Sweet. Sweet. Andy Baldwin said if the show was more interesting, they wouldn't have to chat. Well, he's here, <laughs> so you know what? Damn! Oh. God, I love our, our fan base is so loyal. <laughs> <laughs> hey, is Ryan in the chat tonight? I didn't see him. I want to see Randall and Ryan because they were in episode one. So... They made it all the way to the end. Yep. You know, wait a minute. Is this the end? It, you know, and here's why you do this seasons. Because we do seasons because we're old. And we got to figure out how many years we've been doing this. Right. I like a, a loop feeling. Yeah. yeah it's, it's, it gives you something to look forward to. Right. The, Brian, what the hell have you been working on? Uh, trying to stay upright in the hospital for the most part. But I have very exciting news. Yeah. This is this, actually jealous news. This mm-hmm. fake background here, which is actually in my house mm-hmm. back in Minneapolis, I'm living in this like little 474 square foot apartment. But on Sunday, I have yeah. a few games showing up. Oh, do tell. I, I know. <laughs> as, as the arms cross. <laughs> so I have a Dragon Spirit and Lost Tomb that will be showing up, and then a Crystal Castles cocktail, a Berserk cocktail, and an Asteroids cocktail. Oh, man. I'm uh, sorry, Asteroids Deluxe cocktail. You could just... And I will be traveling back to Minneapolis this weekend to grab my Sin Vectron, so I'm going to have a table high Asteroids Deluxe running the Sin Vectron. You can't. Asteroids Deluxe doesn't extend to table height. I will make it. <laughs> I talked to you about this. I want to make extra. I, I want to make feet for them. Isn't it? Isn't it asteroids that doesn't? But when they went to deluxe, they did it. Nope. I have a deluxe. Yeah. It cannot be extended. Who did I see? Somebody must have swapped the legs out on one. Perhaps. That oh, is interesting. Possible. There's a lot of donor centipedes waiting to have that happen. Yep. Well, I, I will have a crystal castles here. So I think Brian should fabricate legs and then sell them so people can put all of their Atari cocktails I, at bar height. I am used to doing things to legs. <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's kind of your job. Mm-hmm. Eh. I put together like two it. or three legs today. Well, what I've been working on is, uh, you know, a bunch of stuff. Basically, okay. I've been working on this show for the last week. I haven't done anything in the last week except work on this show. And I got this guest that I think will be really good tonight. So that's all I've been working on. Um, I did, uh, let's see, anything arcade related? Nope. I don't, I can't think of anything arcade related that I've done. I did design two new products too. Well, maybe we could talk that in the gadget section. Yeah, they're, they're console products. Console products? Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, you know what? Uh, we are going to skip console corner tonight because, uh, we're going to sort of debut that. We, we, we kind of teased it last week. With the, with the Fairchild Channel F. Um, but we're going to have a, a... On every show, we're going to have a console corner. But this show is console corner all show long. Right? Yeah! Hey. Woo, hell yeah! This Woo-hoo. is all about the Atari VCS, baby. <laughs> Introduced in 1977. The same year as Star Wars. I can't believe that they had them that long and my parents like were like... What are you talking about, Atari? I don't know what you're talking well, about. Well, that's the thing. You know, the other thing, and we'll pro- you know, Howard will probably talk about this, but, you know, the game system, by the time he, like, actually started developing for E.T., that system was ancient. You know. It's crazy. Right. I can't believe some of the stuff they did on that system with what they had. And I can't believe what people do today with, you know, the whole homebrew scene. Man, I bought so many games off of Atari age. Uh, I... I I actually forgot something. What? I have other games showing up. Okay. What? Save it for next week because we're moving on to the next section. And I I hope you really like it. It's your section. I always felt that the true stars at Atari was engineering. Engineering. 
So, you're an inventor? Yes, I am. What have you invented? A lot of things. Like? Like a lot of things. Like things that you've heard of. Like? Well, things that you will have heard of, okay? Patents are patents. Arcade gadgets with Brian the Clown. Welcome to the gadget section. It's me of gadgets. My calendar has told me we have arcade radio because it's an hour behind here. Ma. Uh, anyways, <laughs> so uh, change your the time section. zone on your laptop. I well, it's you know, it's Android, like whatever. It's the calendar. Anyhow, more importantly, <laughs> it's Wait, like full just, position. Just to clarify, you are a surgeon, right? I don't have time for this stuff. <laughs> 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 Make sure you mark the leg. Mark the leg with a marker so you know which one you're working on, okay? Got it. Check. Well, I did have an argument with one patient who insisted that we were supposed to operate on one leg, and he has this giant metal frame on the other leg. And I'm like, I'm just going to stop because we're not doing it until next week. <laughs> Fine. We will fix your left leg. He's a like, yes, yeah, the left leg. A leg named Smith. I a was literally I'm sitting there, and I just was like, I need to go. <laughs> Getting back to gadgets. All right, yes. Um, back so to the gadgets. Is, so Jason has started a pull position. So there's a theme tonight in the gadget section. Mm. I'm speaking about gadgets that people in our chat, or who generally in our chat, mm. have worked on. Okay. So uh, Jason came out with the pull position thing, and that's the link here. And then um, there are two. Uh, so this is this has sparked a huge tick up, up in people being interested in pole positions and there are two new products that are coming out one vector collector is doing a pole position switcher board with two and one switcher for pole position so you can change between the original boards and the new uh, fpga or raspberry pi boards and the other is that millstar well-known uh person who's been on the show before Miles is Star? making what steven beal yeah excellent it, oh. it is making uh, throttle cables. Interesting. So you know you should uh, check it out. Um, it's he's doing doing a like one person who bought it giveaway. I don't know if that's still going on, but these are both on KLOV. <laughs> so if you have a pull position, you need to fix it a little bit. Go for it. Excellent. Uh, the other thing, since I was told to be expeditious tonight, oh. Crafty Mech is coming out with his LED sign. Uh, finally, he's getting back to work on that. And for those of you who don't know what this is, it's an LED matrix that he's creating a lot of different arcade pixelated art for it uh, so that you can basically have a neat little like game over sign like Mark has in the background. So uh, my hands like appear and disappear. But it also has like you can do like ghosts across it. You can do all kinds. You of do things. ghosts. You can do clocks. You can do all sorts of things. And then, Venus. Oh, do, wait, no. Yes. <laughs> if you'd like. <laughs> That was Jason. That was Jason Cop on the uh, on the vector scope. That was the Zoom guy, the blonde guy, uncircumcised. Oh, no. oh yeah. By the way, uh, okay, so we have seasons going, but we're going to have an arcade radio happy hour uh, during the break. We might have two, uh, but we're for sure having one. So we'd love to see all of you there. Um, anyway, Brian, gadgets. Last gadget of the night. Another chat member who's here, mm -hmm. causing problem in the chat. The Gleek. A shout out to the him. The Gleek! By the way, your prize went out two days ago. I hope it arrives soon. If your brass bushings are rattly on your Tempest mm -hmm. and do that nice little you spin it too fast and it buzzes Brrr. the spinning, check it out on KLV. The Gleek has kits there. Nice. Kits are, I forgot now, they're like $20, aren't they? Isn't he giving like a discount for arcade radio listeners? I think he should. I think he is. I don't know. I mean, he says twenty dollars for shipped with pants a two dollar required. Discount. No, no pants yeah. necessary. But, but I'm pretty sure he had a special arcade radio discount. <laughs> <laughs> he got it today. Adam. Sweet. What did I? What did I send you, the Gleek? Because I forgot. You got to tell us in the chat. Did you notice the white powder? <laughs> <laughs> I, actually i sent out the majority of the prizes went out on tuesday uh because uh the post office had a problem with all of their kiosks i went to like three kiosks and it wouldn't take any of my money and uh, and i was talking to this lady and she's like i have the same problem i can't so anyway I, they went out I on tuesday what's that impression of that lady was perfect oh it was good. i don't Spot know what up. happened it was just, uh, so anyway uh it was great 
Uh, I did not get anything out over the weekend, but I do get things going on Tuesday. And so a lot of people probably got stuff today. Yeah. Oh, you got a Pac-Man shirt. All right. Well, Smokinator saying, you get a kit, you get a kit, everyone gets a kit. I like that. We should do that. Everybody a, gets a Tempest oh, yeah. kit. He got an arcade radio mouse pad. We had a lot of gifts. And nice. it was great because uh, it was a great season of, of giving out of the what's in the juke. Uh, but tonight we have a contest. Mark, why don't you tell us about the contest? Yes, the contest. If you go to arcaderadio.com slash contest <laughs> and use secret code word HSW, that counts as a word, right? Yeah, HSW. Yeah. You could win a, a DVD copy of oh, uh, oh, HSW's, uh, was it Once Upon Atari? Yep, Once yes. Upon Atari. It is a documentary that he started filming in the mid-90s and finished in 2000-something-something. Something. And uh, it's signed. A, yeah, and it's signed. You get a oh, signed. I thought it was the Gleek. It's the glitch. I messed it up. Oh. oh. Hmm. I messed it up. I was too tired last night. I apologized. Okay. By the yeah, way, so it's signed. Awesome. And uh, the other prize tonight are these three cartridges. Three pack of Atari cartridges. Of the ones that... that I, and we're going to put a little Arcade Radio sticker on here so you can remember this night forever. Out Scott Warsha. Oh, All the dreams will was... begin this evening. These cartridges contain code that our guest wrote. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Pretty cool. All are, right, so... Are they tested working? I think we should move on to the next section. Oh, oh okay, boy. sure. I just, oh boy. Yeah. Mm. Well, you know, sometimes I hit the wrong button. Uh-huh. It, it happens occasionally. Wait. I'm supposed to go next. Yes. But yeah. You jumped too far. You jumped too Don't far. you have some news? Well, maybe. Let's try this. It's the arcade. Wait. <laughs> That's right, ladies and gentlemen. Prepare yourselves. It's the Arcade News with Adam Stevens. That's me. And tonight we have plenty of news for you, but we're only going to do one article. Because we can. <laughs> <laughs> From Gamespew.com soon, you can have a legendary Polybius arcade cabinet in your home. Polybius, you say? Yes, even video games have urban legends. One of them is Polybius, an arcade game that allegedly popped up in Oregon in the 1980s, only to disappear without a trace soon after. During its time in arcades, it supposedly had an addictive and trance-like effect on its players. While we can all agree that sounds like the stuff from fantasy, Paul, it sounded a little bit like Ringo Starr there for a minute. So, uh, Polybius still has a, carved out a place for itself in popular culture. It's featured in numerous pieces of media, podcasts, blah de blah arcade spirits, anyway, they're making a cabinet, these guys, uh, Numskull, and they're doing a Kickstarter, and it's basically a 10-port USB hub that you can connect all of their other products to. So, anyway, Polybius is going to help you complete your collection of Numskull quarter arcade, you know, machines. So I think these guys are like a, a competitor to, um, uh, what's it, Retrocade, right? Oh. You're looking forward to it? Yeah. <laughs> I wish that music would stop. Oh, let's. You know what? I think it's time to move on to the next section. Back in '82, I used to be able to throw a pigskin a quarter mile. Back, back to the, to cave. the cave with with. Why are things so heavy in the future? Is there a problem with the Earth's gravitational pull? Yes, Doc, there actually is a problem with your gravitational pull. What is happening? I don't know. I, the gravity just pulled me over the side. <laughs> For a second, I only saw Brian's hand over his shoulder like like he had a lover. Yeah. I know. That's ter okay, that's awesome. And terrifying. Uh, uh, hey! What? <clears throat> it's story time, Runner. I have background music. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, let's uh, let's get that queued up. Go ahead. Right. <laughs> As with, yeah, yeah, ooh. As with several other video games for the 2600 system, 
a miniature comic book was included in the game package of Yar's Revenge to illustrate the story behind the game. Yeah, there was a bunch of those. Like, Star Raiders had one. Star Raiders, that was that the game that had a special pad or something yeah, to it? Yeah, it had a special yeah. pad. Figure that out. The comic book explains the revenge of the game's title in terms of Yars avenging the destruction of one of their worlds, Razak 4. Razaks 1 through 3, totally fine. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Atari also released an album under the Kid Stuff Records label, whatever that means, which contains a theme song and a radio drama style reading of the expansion uh, the, of the comic book story. Is that? Oh, a Adam happens to own this thing. I, I, th I never thought it existed, and there it is, right there. Unopened? Unopened. Holy moly. Yep. There's actually a different seven inch recording explaining it's the tragedy. An adventure story. Is that what. You that revealed that a Yar could use himself to target the Zorlon cannon rather than eating from the barrier. Oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah. I am the Gleek, da da da. I said the same damn thing. It's the sample they used in da da da. Right. That must have been like a really cheap uh, like sound machine that made that A stuff. Casio keyboard. What's that's definitely Casio. First prize. <laughs> did, did, did you say you, you think, think this is a like a, a redo of the song or? No, I don't know what this is. This is amazing. I'm gonna play a little bit of it louder, okay? It's so creepy. <laughs> Yars revenge. I think this is on the album. Oh wow. Yars, Yars, Yars Revenge. Revenge. Kind of makes me want to make a single Yars and stick it in my jukebox. Do it. <laughs> I didn't shrink wrap it. How did I get this exciting adventure story on there? <laughs> like I didn't That's right. print that. You printed that too? Yeah, yeah, there's like a little sticker here for how much it was worth. Like a dollar. Yeah. From a globe store or something? It's a cutout though. It's, you know. It is what it is. I have Asteroids hey, I mean, and some other ones, too. Nice. That's well, an awesome so. song. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Thanks. That's It's story time runner. Story time runner. It's hard to say that all in the one thing. It's the time run story. Story time runner is done. Oh. And now we have to ask the question to Adam. <laughs> What's in the juke? Oh. All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome Hi. to What's in the Juke. It's the game within a game within a game, but not really. We'll play a short clip today of a game of actually... Uh, I got thrown off of my whole thing. We're going to play a short clip from a console game cartridge from the Atari 2600. Hmm. You usually play stuff from the 80s, but yes, your task do. is the same. You must identify the title for which you will be warded. I think you should Half be warded. Point. I think it should go all the way up to the... Full point. Yes, because, no. I mean, they're all Atari games. Okay, so we're just going to do the title and that's it? So, I think it's going to have to be like that. What if they know the artist? What's that? What if they know the artist? Holy crap. I, do any of us know the artist? Well, we know at least uh, maybe a couple of them. Okay, fine. You'll get a bonus point Half if you point. can aim the programmer. Okay, fine. Full yeah. point. <laughs> We're full points. No math today. It's all going to be whole numbers. Okay, please. full points only. And? Take and time. if you don't know what it is, fight it out. Oh, Billy Seven joined the chat. Just in time well, for the Atari 2600. What's in the juke? That's right. So remember, guys, arcaderadio.com slash contest, secret co code word HSW. That's how you get your chance for the two prizes. Tonight, you're fighting for honor. Oh, on by the way, the you. prizes will be drawn at 9 p.m. 9. Central. Central. Let's begin. Let's begin. Begin. Huh. Begin. Begin. All right, so we have a number of songs, and uh, here comes your first track. Pause. <laughs> <laughs> I 
that's awesome. Let's see uh, if anybody got that. Uh, is Team Relford ready? Well, <laughs> so far nobody. Well, the, the problem is, is that there's no music in the juke tonight. And not Defender, not Tank, not Moon Patrol, not Combat, not Defender. Wow. Battle Zone. Battle Zone. The Smokinator. For one point. Hey, I have a weird thing I have to tell you guys. Full point. What is it? I have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> I'll be back. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Somebody take over. Oh my gosh, he must really have this to go. This never happened. I that, should not. This is a first and a last. Because it's might season be an four finale. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. You, Mark. I'll be right back. Mark. You don't want me to do this during the interview. <laughs> no. No. Come, yeah. Do what you got to do. So we should play a song then. Just have some fun. Should we improvise? I think we should keep going. We, well, we got... are you ready to... Are you ready to... Uh, I'll keep track of them. You intro them. Okay. Next, Next one, one, I'll, I'll keep, keep track, track of who it is in the chat. chat. Well, poor... I feel naked without Mark. That's, That's kind of scaring, scaring me. me. <laughs> okay, here comes your next track. Now that's uh, an Atari 2600 game. Which one is it? You can get it. I know you can. Who's going to get it? <laughs> There's, There's one, one sound there that is almost, almost identical. identical. Like, like one little, little combination, combination of tones. It's almost identical to the arcade. Yeah, yeah. There we go, Joe Drosen. Joe Drosen. Joe Drosen. Full point. There you go, buddy. All right, here comes your next track. Cut it. That's all you need. <laughs> Blue Blue Hunt. Duck, Duck Hunt. Hunt. <laughs> Duck Hunt. Duck Hunt? What the hell? <laughs> Burger uh, time. Was Blueprint yeah. on the 2600? I th well, it was on the 5200. I think it actually is on the 2600. Yeah. Mr. Do. Star Wars. E.T. Adventure. No. Nope. Hey, yo, Eddie gets it. Uh, sort of. That's actually not the name of the game. Oh, that's true. Alan Pinion. Alan, Alan Pinion got it. Alan Pinion, you get a full point for that. Thanks for playing tonight. Okay, here comes your next track. Wow. I can't believe we put up with these sounds. <laughs> There's an echo. Do you hear an echo? Did I don't, have, but I'm, I'm turning, turning stuff, stuff down, down just in case, case things, things are picking, picking it up. up. Oh, yeah, I got On you. That note. We got rid of it. Don't worry. It's gone. Yo, yo Eddie got it. Uh, yo, Eddie got a full point. point. All right, that's awesome. Okay, here comes your next track. Why is that so quiet all of a sudden? I don't understand. All right. <laughs> Yeah. Nope, not Kaboon. Asteroids is correct. Mike Page. Mike Page. Full yeah. point. For Mike this Page. This is funny. It's like we're, it's like this week it's somebody different on every single one of these. Yeah, this is interesting. Donkey Kong. All right, here we go. Here comes your next track. Wait, I have a contention here. I'm going to play it. Oh, that's definitely asteroids. 
He does not. We, we almost picked uh, Space Invaders, but we did not. So, uh, who got yours, Revenge? I am the Gleek. The Gleek. Oh, point. by Billy Seven. Sweet. Okay. Uh, here comes your next track. That's a tough one. I'll play it again. <laughs> this is this one might be one that people don't get. I love this game, but I didn't I, reckon. Go ahead. It's fun. it's funny because I didn't like this type of game oh. on those systems because it felt so stupid with the noise. <laughs> sure, sure. I I thought this was a fun game though. It's not Philly. Fun. Oh, Yoetti. Yoetti got bowling. It. Nice bowling for the Atari Twenty Six Hundred. That is correct. Oh boy. Nice. It sounds like a car trying to start. We now have Yoetti in the lead with two points, followed by a five-way tie for second. <laughs> All right, here comes your next track. <laughs> I have no idea what that is. <laughs> Terrible. It's a shooting. It's a shooting game. Someone's getting shot. Todd Fry. Mike Todd. Page gets it. Nice. That says Mike Page, you got a full back. point. Full point. We're back. All right, this is one of my all-time favorites right here. And here's your track. I think this is my second favorite game on the Atari 2600. Yars Revenge being the first. All right, and that yeah. was not gun. Yeah. It was missile command. Mike, Mike Page. Page full takes point, a commanding lead with three points, followed by Yoetti at two points. All right, here's your last. What's that? Four-way tie. Here's your here's last track. I like this one. <laughs> Four keys. Do the deck. Well, come on, Mark. <laughs> Where'd you... Joe Drosen. It is E.T. I like oh, how boy. Joe Drosen just starts peppering. You should have just... Pac-Man, E.T. Pitfall. <laughs> <laughs> He's still guessing. <laughs> he didn't actually know the answer he just is guessing he's like all right uh, okay <laughs> oh what's it so you know we didn't give away you know we didn't have any trivia about music tonight which is kind of sad yes should we uh who won tonight brian the winner tonight is Mike Page with a score of three, followed by a two-way tie for second place with Joe Drosen and Yoetti, followed by a three-way tie for third place with the Smokinator, Alan Pinion, and I Am the Gleek. Nice. Well, right. you know, we've got all kinds of time left. Why don't we play a song or two? Anyone know what that song is? The Bicycles. The Bicycles. <laughs> it is The Bicycles. And um, by the way, what's not in the juke? Let's go, Mike Page. He got another one. He just pulled that right out of there. The Cars, I Am the Gleek. All right. Because we love those guys. All right, how about this one? This is nine seconds I, of each song. I, I always associate that song with calisthenics for some reason. Re that's weird. I love that song so much. Yeah. That one is uh, one of my all-time favorite songs by this artist or group. <laughs> and by the way, I feel so much better. So. Brad Holman tells me that my album is for sale on Discogs at a pretty nice is price. <laughs> 
Yeah, I you know it's funny. I've got Asteroids and I think Defender. I think there was a series of records that came out. Foreigner, 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 urgent, urgent, urgent. Mr. Peabody is correct for a half point. And Brad Holman with Foreigner or Foreigner or Foreigner. Or Farnar. I like the next one. I am the Gleek. Foringer. <laughs> All right, I'll give you one more time. I don't think we've ever played that. Oh, for sure. I'm a... Yeah. So, oh, man. <laughs> All right, so, uh, Mark, tell us about the contest again. We, we have three cartridges as uh, one of the prizes uh, from Howard Scott Warshaw, and we're giving away a DVD tonight. Oh, yeah, right? That's right. If you guys, you've got to go to arcaderadio.com. That's R with an, with an R. Caderadio.com slash contest. Use secret code word HSW. Fill out the uh, fill out the information and then reap the benefits. Of free <laughs> stuff. <laughs> you must be present to win. Must be present. Uh, when are we gonna draw? Nine p.m. Central. Nine p.m. Daylight PM. savings time. Central. Oh. As the crow as the crow flies. Well, you know, I think we uh, might have to play some arcade radios. You know, some what? <laughs> we might have to play some arcade radios voicemails. Oh yeah, a voicemail would be great. Do we have voicemail. Yeah, let's check it out. Do we? All right. Um, here comes your first one. Uh... Thank you for calling six one two five four eight game. This is arcade radio. Please leave your message after the tone. Hi, like, um, this is Jessica, and I'm calling from 1982, and I'm playing Raiders of the Lost Ark on my Atari, and I just have to tell you, it's like Trey Bitchin, um, Indiana Jones. <laughs> what just happened? Did that... It's like disconnected. I, we lost it. Okay. Because somebody's uh, joining in our chat here. Okay. Well, let's get him in there. He's just in time for another voicemail. I'll add him in. All there right. We go. He's uh, getting added. The addition is happening. Math! Hopefully it's the right guy. Hello there. Well, hi Hello. there. Oh, did I not get the? Uh, I don't think I hit the video. That's oh, okay. You hit your video. No. Oh, there we go. Let's there get that all squared go. away now. That's me. <laughs> all right. You Let picking me... up my feed? We, uh, we got you. We're just. Uh, let's see. I think I got it. Let's. Uh... Yep. Adam is moving your picture into the. YouTube stream. There we go. Ever so gently. There we go. Look oh. who we got on board. We got Mr. Howard Scott Warshaw. All right. We, we haven't Hello even done there. his. We haven't even done his interview yet, but you know. It's over. No. That's it. <laughs> well, we actually we just got done with what's in the juke. You would have liked it. it was uh, instead of music tonight, we did Atari sounds. Wow. So uh, we had uh, Missile Command and Yars of Revenge and Raiders of the Lost Ark and E.T. People Interestingly, got... the sound effects, did you know the sound effects from Yars of Revenge were actually used in the movie Airplane 2? Oh, that's a... Really? Yes. How come I didn't know and that? In the scene where the kid goes into the control tower and he starts playing with the controls to spin the plane around and stuff... They don't use the screen, but the sounds they're playing there are the sounds from Yara's Revenge. It's hilarious. I was really excited to see that. I'm going to watch that tonight after we're done. It's, it's not early that long. in the movie. Oh, that's good. Cause... So it won't take long. Man. I, I love that one. It's Shatner, you know, blinking and flashing and blinking and flashing. <laughs> so good. All right, we got a couple of voicemails. We should check them out. 
Okay. All right. We're going to check these voicemails out. Howard, you might be entertained by them. You might not. I'm open to entertaining. <laughs> All right, let's check this out. I got a, um, I, oh, what? I hit the wrong button again. I hate that when it happens. Oh. Thank you for calling 612-548-GAME. This is Arcade Radio. Please leave your message after the tone. Oh, my goodness. Well, something's wrong with this. I'm telling you. Unless it's in code. Silent code. Yeah, I... I thought we had more voicemails than this, but we do not. All right, let's check this out. Um, All the dogs. Hey, okay. Whoa. A secret message. <laughs> Thank you for calling 612-548-GAME. This is Arcade Radio. Please leave your message after the tone. Hey, Arcade Radio. It's your most frequent caller, Bob Zarzadek, control panel expert and technician. Hey, I'm totally out of jail now, guys. <laughs> it's great to have access to my whole Ryan Felipe movie collection once again. <laughs> it, you know, at long last, I have all of the cheese balls I can eat at my fingertips, and and also on my fingertips. <laughs> hey, I, I moved back into my shipping container that I have behind the Walmart, and I only had to get into, like, you know, two fights with hobos. At least I, I think they were hobos. They had, you know, real hairy feet. And they kept calling me Gandalf. And I was like, how dare you? And, and so I, you know, threw cheese balls at them, of course. And then they ran away. And, I, you know, that counts as a win in my book. Anyway, uh, congrats on your season finale. And hello to Howard. Big fan of Yar's Revenge here. You know, I, I always wondered what happened to her after she died on Star Trek The Next Generation. Ha! Huh, so, yeah, good to know. She's a fly now. I get it. <laughs> okay, okay, you guys take care. Have a great interview. I'll probably talk to you next year, most likely, for for sure. Zarza Zar deck out. Thank you for calling 612-548-GAME. This is Arcade Radio. Please leave your message after the tone. Hi, like, this is Jessica, and I'm calling from 1982. And um, I'm just wondering if Howie can maybe let me know a couple Howie. of things. I'm playing um, Raiders on my Atari, and it was, like, totally hard to even do that because my dirty little brother, Michael, um, got the game for his birthday. And I was like, hey, Michael, let me play. And he was all, whatever. And I was like, come on, give me a turn, seriously. And he's like, why don't you go play with your strawberry shortcake dolls? And I'm like, egg man. Uh, wait. Oh my god! Uh, I got to the next level! Okay, anyway, um, this game is like totally fiction. And obviously, Indiana Jones is like the best actor ever. I mean, him and Gopher um, from Love Boat. But anyway, um, I gotta run pretty soon because my brother's outside on his BMX. And he will, like, totally go apeshit if he sees me playing with this. And my dad will, like, punish me by, like, making me play Pong in the den. So, anyway, um, I just wanted to know if Howie could give me, like, Indiana Jones's phone number. Um, because it would be, like, totally tubular if I could, like, you know, meet him or something. So, anyway. Anyway, I got a motor. I'm grabbing this TT fly. And then I got to go to some, like, a Mesa or something. So, anyway, talk to you later. Wow, that was detailed. <laughs> that was really detailed. Very great. No, anyone who's calling me Howie obviously is not trying to get information. That's for sure. <laughs> no. She clearly no. doesn't know your name is Howard. <laughs> I was like, Howie? I was like, wait, that Mandel? <laughs> it, it, you know what? I noticed in one of your shirts you had a T-shirt that said How Weird. And it was, like, was that a Howard Stern T-shirt from the back in the day? Oh, no, that was a Howard Scott Warshaw T-shirt. That shirt has quite a story behind it. Oh, really? Awesome. Uh, yeah, that shirt was part of a birthday surprise that my girlfriend at the time prepared for me. I came into work one day, and this was while I was doing E.T. So this was in the middle of the entire E.T. fiasco. Yeah. And my birthday occurred right in the middle of that project. And so one day I came to work, and everybody is wearing these t I mean, like, everybody... <laughs> That's one of these T-shirts. And I show up and like, 
what? And I saw someone had like an orange T-shirt. I wasn't really paying attention because my head was like totally zoned in out of what I was working on. And then I saw someone else. I thought, geez, I, I don't usually see people with the same colored shirt around here that often. And then I saw a third one and I stopped and I started to look at it. And I thought, that looks like me. <laughs> because what that was, was it was a caricature of me dressed, I mean, but as a yar. So it was me the way I usually look with my sandals and my jacket and stuff. And... I'm wearing a How Weird t-shirt, and it says How Weird underneath it, and I have antennae and wings and stuff, so that's me <laughs> as a yar on the t-shirt, and that was a surprise day. And then we had a uh, department meeting. We had a very intense department meeting that day, and everyone showed up wearing that t-shirt. <laughs> and I have to say, best dressed department meeting ever. <laughs> wow. <laughs> All right, well, let's kick off that interview with that. I think that's great. Oh, boy. Here we go. Oh, there's a lot of controversy on this show. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Howard Scott Warshaw. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's we've been looking forward to having you on all night. We got a, a boatload of chatters here with us. Uh, we got about thirty-two people in the chat right now, concurrently listening and ready to ask questions. Uh, but I think Mark's going to kick off the first question. I'm pretty sure, besides the one he just asked. Right, I didn't even know he got got to have it. <laughs> so, I guess my first question is: there were a lot of arcade games to play at atari and mm. how many of them were not even atari games can you remember some of the titles well yeah i mean the uh well centipede and millipede were atari titles but sure, right. robotron and defender two oh, yeah. of my favorites uh kicks was one we used to play a lot uh gravitar was pretty cool awesome uh I can't even think of it. The one with the robots where you're running from room to room just trying to Berserk. shoot the robots. Berserk. Berserk, right. That was uh, very popular. Elevator Man was good. Uh, Dig Dug was good. And uh, Dig Dug, had, we had like a French version of Dig Dug or something. So we go, wait, we, eh, hoopla. We <laughs> <laughs> have these French sound effects and you know, French comments <laughs> in the, the game. So those were some of the ones that we played a lot of. I mean, I had a video triathlon. Did I ever tell you about my video triathlon? No. So no. this is what working at Atari is like. Every day I'd come in, you know. At Atari, we had a rule that you ha you can't come in until you want to, and you have to stay until you want to go. Okay. And that was the day. But that turned out to be a pretty long day for most people because it was a really cool place to be. But whenever I would come in, I would motor in, dump my stuff in my office, and I would head straight for the game room. And what I would do is I would play... Uh, Robotron, Millipede, and Defender. And I had to get over 100,000 on each game. And I didn't come out of the game room until I had over 100,000. I called that my video triathlon. <laughs> and that was every day I went in there. And some days I could do that in like 15 minutes. I'd go in, just bam, I was hot. And I'd just knock it out. And there were times where I came out of there just to go to lunch before starting the day because it was just <laughs> it was a rough day and I just couldn't quite score. So were you superstitious? Did you think that, you know, like by when you walked out in fifteen minutes were you gonna have a great coding day or No, nah, it wasn't like superstition. It was just sort of a way of grading myself, saying, you know, what kind of day am I prepared for? Where am I at? How, sure. how focused am I? Those are hard games. Robotron especially. Yeah, Robotron. I, I think Ro Eugene Jarvis, right? The guy who yep. did both Defender and Robotron. Best game designer ever, in my opinion, particularly <laughs> for you know early arcades. That guy really knew how to make a compelling game that just kept you rolling and rolling and rolling, especially when it's set for free play. I think we had him on the show twice in season two. Twice. If people want to tune in and look at those. I, I love that. I think he was on the season finale and then the, the, yep. the, the, the premiere, I think. Yeah, he big, was big fan, big fan of Eugene. I loved. Uh, we put a quote in in the show the, the second time he joined us, and he says, "Anybody gonna watch this thing anyway?" <laughs> right. <laughs> it's great. So uh, you drew lots of inspiration from arcade games. In fact, I think that might lead into a, a Yars a Yars Revenge conversation. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. 
I could tell you a lot about it if you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Lots of Yars stories. I mean, well, Yars, you know, a lot of people know another game that we had was... Uh, Star Castle? From Cinematronic, Star Castle, exactly. And that was the uh, supposed to be... So my first assignment, I mean, let me just say briefly, when I came to Atari, I interviewed, went through the whole process, got all set, and they rejected me. Oh. They did not make me an offer. And so I actually had to talk uh, the hiring manager into giving me a shot. And I begged, pleaded, and did everything <laughs> I could. And so I came in to Atari on probation for a major cut in pay. All right. Oh. Cars <laughs> revenge. Plural possessive. Yes. You don't With get it, to see uh, that in video games all the time. Now, I want to know more about that, but tell me about the inspiration out of Star Castle. What, what challenge did you have that ended up being Yars Revenge? So what happened was, like, I'm there a couple of days. I'd read the manual. I looked over, you know, what the hardware was supposed to be. And they gave me my assignment. So I looked over Star Castle, played the game some, looked at it, took what I, what I knew so far about the 2600, and I went to my boss and said, uh, you know, this game on the 2600 is going to suck. It's just going to suck. And I don't want to do a game that sucks. So, uh, and I made a proposal. I said, look, I can reorganize the, some of the game topographically. I can do a few different things. I could make, make, reorganize this. And I gave him a proposal for a different game that basically was the game that was the basis of Yara's Revenge. And uh, I got to say, I was very fortunate. I was there early enough in the uh, in the timeline that they allowed me to just go ahead and do it. They agreed with me because I just I just made a case for it. But it was kind of funny that like basically I've said, you know, I'll do anything. I'll do anything you want. Just please give me a chance. Give me any chance. Let me in. Let me try to do something. I said, <laughs> OK, come on in here. Do this game. I said, nah, I'm not going to do that game. That's going to suck. <laughs> <laughs> So it was kind of a funky thing to do, given that I was on probation. But it turned out to be good. And that became, and and what I just started doing Yara's Revenge, except it wasn't Yara's Revenge. It was Time Freeze. The first working title for Yara's Revenge was Time Freeze. Interesting. And because uh, one of the things that I had at the from the very beginning was this idea that I wanted to do a sensational payoff sequence. I wanted there to be something huge that happened. When you, whenever you, you know, you kill the boss or when you do the big thing, whatever yeah. that's going to be. I just wanted to have major, major screen eruption going on because <laughs> I always felt video games undersold payoff. Like, like Missile that, Command yeah. at the end of Missile Command. When you, when you die, there's a payoff when you die. It's a yeah. <laughs> yeah. There should always be death sequences and things like that. I think, you know, you exit a game in style just like you enter it. Yeah. That's awesome. But that so, was the beginning of Yara's Revenge. So Star Castle, be, and you can kind of see where inspiration would have been drawn from that a little bit. Um, and I, but I, I gotta say, Yara's Revenge probably my favorite Atari game of all time. Uh, Missile Command is actually a pretty close second, and, and a bunch of other games. But Missile Command is a pretty good game. I got a story about Missile Command too in Yara's. Well, you got to tell us that then. Well, the thing was that. One of the amazing, and by the way, this is all covered in my upcoming book. Oh. I just want to put that out oh. there. But uh, I go into great detail about these. But one of the things that was interesting was Yara's Revenge. Uh, it, the game sucked initially. I mean, I wasn't, it, I, the controller was off. It was really horrible. The thing wasn't quite working. It looked really cool. I mean, I got a cool looking screen up, and everybody was like, ooh, ah, look at the new kid. Look what he's doing. <laughs> and it was like, and that was cool, but the game sucked. And I couldn't think of what to do. And then I got a, an idea and somebody told me, hey, you know, you need to change the controller thing. Like, of course. <laughs> and, <laughs> but uh, the problem was that I needed a different play mechanic to make the controller work the way it should. So uh, it made me change the design of the game in a way that suddenly made everything come to life. It was one of these things where you make a couple of tweaks and then suddenly, oh, my God. It's like when the you know the the girl with the glasses and the bun t lets her hair down and takes off the glasses and suddenly oh my god look she's beautiful. <laughs> you know, yes. It's like it was that equivalent in video games. It was like the thing was a total mess and then suddenly it was amazing and everybody loved it and it was huge and even Dave Toyer the guy who did Missile Command for Coinop and who did Tempest was thinking of making a coin-op game based on Yara's Revenge. We made home games based on coin-op games. Nobody ever talked about doing a coin-op game from a home game. Holy crap. Didn't yeah. happen, but still, it was a lovely thought. And somebody <laughs> actually ended up making one, 
and you signed a marquee. Yes, I did. But that what they did was they took yours and just put it in a coin op cabinet. Okay. So it's not really a coin op yours revenge per se. It's did just it? The, you didn't put a coin in. You had to just put a start button or something. Uh, they might. They had it set up so you could theoretically hit a play button, but all that did was hit the start button sure. on the VCS. It was still a VCS version of yours. Yeah, yeah. But uh, so what happened was the game was hot. Everybody wanted to see it go. I wanted to see it go. This is my first game. I'm trying to get my first release. And release at Atari is a very important thing. (laughs) And so uh, so wanted to get that out. And then suddenly somebody was like trying to hold up the game or kill the game. And so it was like, we're all set to release the game, super popular with all the engineers and some, and suddenly the word comes down that there's some playability concerns. We're, we're not sure. So it's okay. We'll do a focus group. They do a focus group. Goes great. Goes great. Go, okay. Here we go. We're going to release the game up. Oh, there's still some playability concern. So then we went through several rounds of this of releases interrupt us is what I call it. <laughs> and it was like killing me. And so finally they decided what we're going to do is we're going to do the big play test. A play test, you know, focus groups is where you bring like eight people in and you feed them pizza and then they get grease on the controllers and then they tell you about the game. Yeah. A play test is where you bring over a hundred people in, they play the target game and they play the control game and they score each of them and they compare the scores. So the big thing about a play test is what's the game you're going to be up against. So the game they chose to test Yars against was Missile Command for the 2600. And I thought, oh, no, you have <laughs> got to be kidding me. I mean, they say if you're going to be the best, you got to beat the best. And I think that's true, but I would definitely have settled for going up against a really crappy game and just win. Yeah, like bowling. Exactly. I mean, I would have been totally fine with that. Uh So I was sweating it out. But the amazing thing is that after this was over an entire weekend, I spent in like a small box with three or four other people. And uh, at the end of it, when the smoke clears, Yars Revenge actually beat Missile Command in the play test was the highest scoring game they ever tested. And so suddenly all the playability concerns disappeared in addition to a few other people. And the game was released, and That's that awesome. was it. Finally, well, I'm going to play the promised land. I'm going to play a, a a little uh, clip here for you to listen to, and, and you can see it on if you're on uh, on the chat here. But uh, let, let's just uh, let's just play this one right now, and, and see if you remember this. I said I could play Yars Revenge. Who's getting even with who? You'll see. Yars Revenge is a video game cartridge you have to buy separately to play on the Atari video computer system. Your parents hook it up to the TV. Now you're supposed to be Yars fighting a bad coach. <laughs> you got him, Genie. Can I stay up late? Good night, Steven. <laughs> did you hear that? I did hear that. And and I, I don't think it showed up on the screen, before. but that uh, that is the Yars Revenge commercial with uh, Seth Green. Little Seth Green. He was tiny. When he's he still needed a babysitter. I understand he's actually still dating that babysitter. I love him. <laughs> and he's still tiny, also. Just FYI. Right. <laughs> Seth is a very clever guy. But this this was another point of controversy with Yars. There was a lot of controversies around Yars Revenge, and one of them was that their whole testing thing demonstrated that, you know, you know, there's basically four demographics. There's, there's boys and girls and men and women when yeah. they do the testing. And the group that it tested highest with was adult women. So that was kind of interesting. And it was like, you know, one thing I really like is appealing to adult women. That's something I've always <laughs> been in favor of. Yes. And so... You know, I was psyched about that, but they sold the game to 10 year old kids. I mean, they really uh, they targeted their marketing to very young kids, yeah. even younger than a lot of the other games they would advertise. And I could never figure that out. There's there's a very funny scene in the book where I go through this whole thing with the marketing people about, you know, why don't you do this? Well, you know, women don't like these games. Well, your testing says they like this game. Oh, no, that women don't like these games. Yeah, but your <laughs> testing says they do. And it was. It was just, there were a lot of things at Atari that made absolutely no sense. And your problem would be if you expected them to make sense. Because you, you shouldn't expect things to make sense. When you really expect things to make sense, 
you're losing touch with Atari. Because Atari <laughs> was never about making sense. Atari was about making fun and outrageous stuff. That's that's awesome. So, so go ahead, Brian. So I was going to say, like, you talked about coming in, I mean, talking about making fun and outrageous stuff. And then uh, you're saying kind of your day-to-day, you'd come in and play the games. What what was a typical day like outside of the coming in and, and starting the day off like that in game development? I mean, how was well, it just show up and... The cool thing, a typical day, there was, there really, it was hard to identify a typical day. And that was one of the great things about Atari was there really wasn't a typical day. The only thing that really was typical was you were never bored. You weren't always comfortable, right? Because there were some days you'd come in and you'd do outrageous stuff. It would be very cool. You'd actually create something new. And that's your job description, right? Your job description at Atari is to come in, go to work, and when you leave at the end of the day, something that did not exist that morning should now exist. You you had to really create something new. And that was cool. I loved that job. But there were also days you'd come in and you weren't sure if you'd have a job by the end of the day because there were scary days at Atari too. There were times where you know there's rumors flying around or there's going to be layoffs or somebody's upset or they changed the management and they're not sure what they want to do. And it, was, it could be a very scary, it was a very intense place to work, both up and down. Uh, there was also, I mean, you'd code. We'd do a lot of coding. We'd do a lot of brainstorming together just casually playing each other's games trying to figure out what to do how to make something better uh there were a lot of joints smoked (laughs) in (laughs) offices and stuff like that there was a lot of drugs done at atari not by everyone and not all the time but by some and quite a bit and uh there was there would be amazing people who would show up Sometimes, you know, we'd have real celebrities, we'd have people show up, just interesting people. I worked with, with Spielberg a couple of times, and occasionally he would come through on a tour. The, the Mucky Mucks from Warner would come by, and sometimes when a Warner, when a really high up officer in Warner would come through, sometimes there'd be a bomb scare, which was kind of an interesting <laughs> phenomenon. Uh, you never knew. And also, people had different hours. You didn't know who was going to be there at any time. But at any time around the clock, 24 hours, there was going to be some, someone was going to be in engineering. You didn't necessarily know who, but you know, there were people who worked from night till morning. There were people who worked from morning till night. There was people who come in in the afternoon and work until like the wee hours. You'd find all different kinds of schedules. So having a department meeting was kind of a tricky thing. That required advance notice so that people could actually adjust their schedules. So one of the, you mentioned um, uh, Atari is a place where people could have fun but also be uncomfortable. In the Once Upon Atari documentary, uh, Jerome Durma, uh, Dumura, Dumura, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Been a long day here. Uh, He's having it, a long day, too. He's dead now. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> We made okay, the he comment. was a very good friend. I actually have some of him right here with me, to tell you the truth. Oh. We made the comment that you you made an awful lot of people uncomfortable because you always just want to talk about the the main issue was. I do. I have that habit. I'm uh, I'm I like to make bad jokes, and, but I'm not much of a small talker. What I like to do is sit down with people and say, okay, so here's what I think is going on here. What are we going to do about it? Or here's what I want to do about this. I think this needs to be addressed. And it's not comfortable. It's interesting that I've become a therapist. Okay, as a psychotherapist, I kind of do the same thing, only gentler, more gently. Yeah. But uh, I'm not what you'd call a non-directive, unconfrontational therapist. You know, as when it comes <laughs> to therapy, I help people step right into what's going on. <laughs> and, That's good. and Atari was no different, right? So there would be things going on. There'd be things being messed up. We were, the things would be coming down from management that we wouldn't like, or uh, there could be conflict with other areas, and I would I, w- I would call it out. I would just say, "Hey, what's going on with this? What's up with that?" You know, that's of course mixed with things like there's. We had three labs, right? There was lab A, B, and C, and you had labs where you'd have lots of development stations, and you'd go in, and a bunch of people would be working on it, and then other people had development stations in their offices, and so some people would be in the lab, some people would be in their offices, but one time. So I don't know what happened, but we came in one day and the door to lab A was missing. 
<laughs> and so it was just missing. So I don't know if it was like somebody took it for maintenance or something. I don't know what went on. But for some reason, I was it. And it came up in a department meeting. You know, hey, we're missing the door to have it. What's up with that? <laughs> and I said, well, I said, I don't think this will really be much of a problem. I said, because as a matter of fact, do you know that they actually train animals specifically for this problem? And everybody's looking at me, you know, which is something I encounter fairly regularly. Like, what the hell are you talking about, Howard? And I said, well, haven't you ever heard of a labador retriever? Oh, oh my God. no. See, so that's a prime example of the kind of stuff I would torture people with at Atari. <laughs> There was also mention uh, that you used to do certain voices or do multiple voices. At, at I would, yes. Bob Polaro was talking about that. Bob was from New York, and I'm from New Jersey. So we would have a fun time. So I'd see Bob sitting in the lab. I'd go up there and go, hey, Bob, what's up with that? Hey, hey, how you doing? <laughs> I'd start doing my New York accent. <laughs> hey, what are you working on? You call that a fucking game? Get out of here. What are you talking about? So I would do some of that. I also used to do this thing. Like we had a, a security guard, like which was a slash, you know, like security guard slash receptionist who would, you know, handle the phones during the day. And at five o'clock, they were up. They were done. So they would leave. But calls would continue to come in. So at five o'clock, usually about 505 each day, I would go, a bunch of us would get together in the lobby and I would go and I would sit at the desk and I would start taking calls and I would answer each call in a different accent. You know, so I could use a Japanese accent or a Scottish accent or a Spanish accent or, you know, Russian accent or something. I would just e answer each call with a different accent. I would be like the, the most idiotic receptionist there ever was. And <laughs> whoever they were just had to deal with it, you know, and eventually they'd call back the next day. But it was, uh, and that was fun. That got to be like an entertainment thing. You know, <laughs> I wanted to jump back quickly before we get into the other two titles uh, and abandon yours for this interview. Uh, but you, you gave people hell at the office. You gave the marketing hell. And I, I wanted to know a little bit about why there's an apostrophe at the end of yours revenge, uh, yours, a pl plural, plural possessive. And could you just tell us that story? Because I don't think I've heard the entire story yet on how that, what that means. How that okay, so the name Yars Revenge came about because uh, I'm an overachiever and a control freak. I think that's basically the short version. It's that basically, it came time to name the game. It still didn't have a name. It wasn't Yars Revenge yet. It wasn't Time Freeze, because that didn't really seem to make sense. I had created the character and the graphic. That was the first animation that I did was the Yar, but it wasn't a fly. It was just this thing that had moving parts that I thought would be cool and would look right at various angles, right? That was my basis for the animation. So, but a fly seemed to fit. And so they were going to name it, and sometimes the marketing names back then were kind of lame. And I thought, this is my first game. I need this game to be as, as good as it can possibly be at every level. So I decided I'm going to try and name the game. So I, the product manager came by and he says, uh, hey, uh, we're going to be naming the game soon. What do you think? I said, hey, is it, is it possible for me to make a submission? I'd like to put a name in myself. And he goes, yeah, I, I guess so. That'll be fine. So I told him, come back tomorrow. I will have a submission package for you. And he's like, okay. And so... That night, I'm thinking it up. I'm thinking it over and how to do it. I, I, I go through all these machinations because, frankly, one of the things on my bucket list is adding a word to the English language. I always thought that would be a fun thing to do. And I thought, you know, Pac-Man is all over the place. Everybody knows what Pac-Man is now. I thought if this game really makes it, if it really gets to be a popular game, the name of the character could become common parlance and I could actually contribute a word to the English language, I thought, this is my chance. So cool. So I'm thinking, okay, so what is it? When you try to make up words, they always sound stupid. It's just really hard to make up new words. So I thought, okay, so I'm gonna have a title, so revenge. Revenge has gotta be in the title because revenge is a great title word, right? Because everybody wants revenge. So I figured that's a good one. And now I need a name, I need a name for the character. I can't think of just some name to make up. So I figure I need an algorithm, I need a way to, to, to name it so it means something, so there's a code to it. And then I thought, ah, oh, okay, so who's the CEO of Atari at the time? It's a guy named Ray Kazar. What's Ray spelled backwards? Oh, it's Yar. That sounds good. What's Kazar backwards? Ray Zach. 
oh yeah I've got Y's, I've got Z's. The only thing that's missing is an X. They're perfect sci-fi names, right? <laughs> you notice that sci-fi names always go to the end of the alphabet. You always got the late letters in them. And so I'm thinking, this is cool. So I've got it. So it'll be the yard. I, and I thought, what's better than a title? What's better than a title is a title and a story. You have a whole story behind the title. So I sat down. This is like 8, 9 o'clock at night. I'm still in my office. I sit down and I write a story called The Yarian Revenge of Razak IV. And this story is all about how the first uh, interstellar spaceships got some flies on them. And over time, uh, the flies, you know, through radiation and stuff, mutated into these monster things, ended up killing off all the humans. And they just took over the spaceship and they eventually wound up in this solar system somewhere called the Razak solar system. And they populated the whole system. But then one day this monster comes along, this cotile monster, and the monster eviscerates one of the planets, Razak 4, and all of the Aryan brethren and sistren that were on Razak 4. And the ion zone in the, on the screen, the colorful portion, the center of Yar's Revenge, that's the remnants of Razak 4. That's what's left over from the planet that got wiped out. And so, Yar's revenge is the idea that the Yarian community is now trying to take revenge against the Kotile for having destroyed one of their planets. And that's why, but it's not just one Yar, because Yars die occasionally. You need a whole bunch of Yars to defeat the Kotile in Yar's revenge. So, and that is how Yar's revenge became a plural possessive. That's Although I don't cool. think I've ever put it quite that way. That's awesome. Yeah, well, you know, uh, Mark, I think you're I mean, up. If that answers the question, it totally does. Uh, and I, Mark, was just about to ask you a question. I was just about to answer it. <laughs> is he frozen? In he time, froze. he is, but he'll thaw shortly. I'm oh sure. my gosh, Brian, why don't you take the next one then? This is like when people tape the eyes open on their glasses, <laughs> so everybody else in the meeting thinks they're awake. Right. This is, I think that's what we're seeing here. <laughs> But he's about to uh, rejoin himself. I, I think. think so. Brian, you got that next one? Yeah. So tell us about before uh, Indy when you met Spielberg for the first time. Oh, meeting Spielberg for the first time. That's a whole chapter right there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the cool thing was that I had to get up at like 5 in the morning, which back then was something... I don't do. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a get up early in the morning, dude. I'm a stay up late, dude. And so, uh, but when you're going to go meet Spielberg, you know, what the hell? I had a 930 meeting in LA. I'm starting in San Jose and uh, no private jets this time. And so I go, I, you know, hump to the airport. I get on a commercial flight, fly down to LA, ride a cab through the rush hour traffic in LA in the morning to get to Warner Studios. I get there, I'm all set, it's 9.25 in the morning, I'm like just on time, here we are. I step in, there's the receptionist, I go like, you know, hi, I'm Howard, and as soon as she sees, she goes, oh, hello, Mr. Warshaw, she goes, your meeting's been rescheduled to 3.30. <laughs> <laughs> what? what, what, I flew here, I flew here on an airplane to get here, you're moving my meeting six hours? So that seemed odd, but you know, I'm just me and this is Steven Spielberg, so I'm going along with it. And uh, I ended up having a pretty good time during the day because I got the cruise Warner Studios un unescorted during the six hours in between, so that for me was a treat. But uh, ultimately I got to meet Spielberg and talk with him and it wasn't really just meeting him, it was like I'm pitching him myself, right? Because the thing was, you know, I, I was up for doing Raiders of the Lost Ark, but Spielberg had to approve whoever was going to do the game. So this was like a, another job interview, you know, but I figured the last one worked out okay after they rejected me initially, so we'll see how this one goes. <laughs> but, uh, and I, we're there and we're chatting, and Spielberg and I really got along pretty well. And uh, I showed him Yars Revenge, and we played some Yars for a while, and he dug Yars, and that was cool. And we're chatting and talking a little about Raiders. And, uh, and then I said to him, you know, Stephen, I have a theory about you. I said, I have a theory that you are actually an alien yourself. I said, would you like to hear it? And he's like, sure. So I just lay out this whole theory that I have about, you know, when we meet the aliens, you know, we're, 
it's not like they're going to show up in the spaceship, you know, and here we are. I said, I figure we're going to discover they've been among us already because they're going to be smart enough to socialize us, our culture, and get us ready to meet them. And if you think about it, you know, between Close Encounters and E.T., although E.T. wasn't actually out yet, but uh, it was just based on Close Encounters, Spielberg was someone who was putting out positive alien message movies, and they were getting seen everywhere. So I told him, I figure he's like the production arm of the advanced team, and his marketing team is doing a great job making sure this is seen everywhere and appreciated everywhere. So I just <laughs> wanted to say, you know, good work. You know, you guys are doing a hell of a job, and uh, I'm ready to meet you. Yeah. <laughs> I have to say something here. Uh, Time Runner said he'll be right back. That's Mark. And Wonder Woman in the chat responded with, I'll be right here. <laughs> and so like, wow. That is like off the cuff, E.T., bam. I had to bring That's that up. That's nice. Mark's so, doing better when he's out of the chair than I, he does in. I, I know. It's it. great. <laughs> so you met Spielberg. Who else did you meet? Anyone else? Uh, like we talk- uh, I didn't meet a lot of other super celebs. I met a very interesting physicist and psychic combo. Really? Once. Yeah, they were, there was a time where they wanted to do the mind link controller. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of that. No. There was a, it didn't really go much of anywhere, but there, there was this psychic who and a, and a physicist who was specializing in paranormal activity, sort of like straight out of Ghostbusters. Oh. And he was working with this psychic, and this psychic was a highly reputed psychic who had done a lot of some fairly remarkable stuff. And they were working, and they wanted to do a video game that would promote uh, psychic abilities that would help people cultivate and develop their psychic ability. Interesting. So uh, they came to me with it because they said they had looked at my other games, they'd looked at yours, and they looked at Raiders some, and they thought that I did very visually generous games, and they wanted me to do the game for their stuff because they wanted it to have some pizzazz, right? They wanted it to look not, mm -hmm. look hot. And so what I, when I talked to them for a while and got the picture of what they were really trying to do, I realized I didn't want to have anything to do with this. It was just going to be a, a big dog. And I'm not even going to notice that Mark is coming back in because, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a, it was a no. seamless, seamless transition. It was backwards seamless. He made a background that he flipped. And <laughs> he's in the it was perfect. But, you know, Mark, I just want you to know that someone yeah. is waiting for you. Where? <laughs> someone special. Where? <laughs> oh, they'll be here. Don't worry. <laughs> And it's not going to take a spaceship to get them here, I have a feeling. Oh, man. I am so sorry. I should not have had those hot dogs. That's just all I'm going to say. Right now. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so that was the deal. So I got to meet them. There were other people who got to do stuff like go to New York and work with the, uh, the Muppets and uh, Children's Television Workshop. Yeah. Some people got to go to Japan and work with Tato and Namco and some of, you know, on the original games and talk to the designers. And I never got to do those trips. I just kept running into Spielberg in various places. Sidetrack, you were just in high score on Netflix. In fact, you're the very sure. first face that shows up on the on the screen. And I was delighted to see that. So congratulations on that documentary. Oh, um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's a fun it. documentary. They leave out a lot of details. And you just mentioned, you know, Taito and Namco. And the interesting thing is you're watching it. And they don't mention company names half the time. And I'm, no, they don't. And I'm like, why do they not do that? Is there royalties involved with mentioning the names? Or uh, I don't think so. I think it might have more to do with they just didn't pick up that material. Yeah, and the, <laughs> they, I mean, and they condensed so much. It, it's a fun documentary. Don't get me wrong, and I think it's done fairly well. But honestly, if you want a really good documentary that's deep uh, and talks about all the stuff we're talking to, about tonight, plus gets way more into the culture of Atari. Uh, you need to you need to get a hold of Once Upon Atari, and and uh, and it's fantastic. In fact, why don't you just summarize uh, Once Upon Atari for us? Because we're going to give away a signed copy of that. Oh, actually, tonight. well, I'd be happy to. So, once I mean, Atari was an amazing experience for me. It was just an outrageous experience, and I needed a way to process it myself. So, I actually went to school to become a video producer to be able to do a documentary series. And I went and got all my friends together because I knew everybody who worked there. And I can say, I think, without contradiction, that Once Upon Atari is the only piece of media that is done exclusively and entirely by people who actually were at Atari working on the VCS making games. 
It's just, it's everybody there. And I, they were my friends and they all would sit for me and we did the interviews. And because I was there, I knew what to ask. So I got to a lot of stuff. I needed to do it. I needed to do it for one thing to help me resolve my Atari experience. And for another thing, I've seen so much media on Atari. And the thing that's crazy about the media you see on Atari is as outrageous as it sounds, it wasn't nearly as interesting as what actually happened at Atari. And it, it isn't that often when you see media that's sensationalized but still doesn't quite deliver the actual sensational nature of what happened, but this was one of those cases. So I actually thought I'm going to just make the documentary to tell the truth about what went on at Atari, and that became Once Upon Atari. And that's available at onceuponatari.com. To anybody who wants an autographed copy, you can also view it at uh, gog.com. You can do a streaming download and, and watch it if you want. But if you'd like an autographed copy of the original DVD of Once Upon Atari, go to onceuponatari.com and I will hook you up. Uh, Not necessarily like Mark's <laughs> going to get hooked up, but I mean, I'll get you set up with the DVD. Yeah. And by try. the way, we're giving away one of those tonight. Uh, at 9 p.m., we were going to have the drawing, so 20 more minutes, um, and you will win one of those. Mark, do we have a, like a... I'm uh, glad you guys are doing the drawing, because I can't draw worth a damn. Oh. <laughs> now, that's that's funny. Your uh, your partner, uh, Jerome Dumarat, or D Dumarat. Jerome Demurit. 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 I don't know why I can't say that, so J Jerome Demurit. So he did the art for E.T., um, he did the art for E.T. He did some of the animations in Raiders. He was my very close personal friend for many, many years. And he would be really unhappy if I didn't say at this point, and he's still dead. Oh. <laughs> because he used to say that all the time. Oh, really? Are they? I would say, hey, so-and-so's dead. And he'd go, still? Still? <laughs> he used to do that all the time. We, you know. I probably spent more time, more hours. If, you know, if, if you think about this statistic, like how many hours have I spent in conversation with the various people of my life? You know, everybody's going to have their number. Everybody has their account. Uh, to this day, I am absolutely convinced that I have more hours talking to Jerome Demurat than any other person in my life, and that includes my parents, my siblings, everybody. Wow. wow. <laughs> it's it's just we spent a lot of time talking and going over stuff, and it was never dull. Well, I'm I'm glad you had that good relationship with him. Um, that's that's fantastic, I, and I, I'm glad that he has a great sense of humor too. Uh, so. He really does. In fact, one of the things he was always working on was was the D phone, <laughs> which was going to be an Apple phone you can use from the other side to call up people back. Yes. And that was his thing. It's like he used to say. You know, well, he's going to be dead someday, and he was looking forward to that because it was going to be his opportunity to start doing the dev work on the other side. <laughs> and so, you know, so I'm expecting a call from him almost any moment. <laughs> oh, Those my gosh. Cool dude. He's over there, and it's all Fortran, so it's, it's a big bummer. <laughs> that will suck. At least it's better than basic. Oh, my God. <laughs> my first language. Oops. Yeah, well, mine was basic also. And APL, there's a there's a cryptic language. Oh, good times. <laughs> do you do any development anymore at all? Uh, I do story development. I do not do game development sure. anymore. Although I must say, there's one of the things I was going to do at Atari that I never got around to doing was a Yars Revenge sequel. Okay. And I had a design for a Yars Revenge sequel. I still do. I it's a gameplay. It's an original gameplay. I still have never seen it done in forty years. I have not seen it done yet. So I'm still thinking it's extremely, I mean, I'm currently working on a book, you know, that's also called Once Upon a Tar. Yeah. And in fact, it's dedicated to Jerome. Oh, cool. And uh, so that should be out in the next month or two. And when I'm done with that book, I'm seriously considering getting together with a homebrew and getting someone to just do this design. Yes. And finally, I'd like to put this game out. That'd be great. Yeah should do an arcade port of it oh uh, i should but i don't think i will i'll have someone else do it. <laughs> now i would delegation i would love i'm actually want to build a cabinet for yars uh and and do a coin operated version of it using the atari game but uh i just had a question in the chat uh and, and we were going to ask this anyway um this one comes from billy seven uh tell us about the yars uh 
Easter egg, and then, and then tell us about any other Easter eggs as long as we're talking about Easter eggs. Well, if you want to talk Easter eggs, you're talking to the right guy. <laughs> so, All right. We don't have to be in season. All uh -huh. right. You know, Warren Robinette invented the Easter egg in Adventure, right? Yes. I did not invent Easter eggs, although I've seen stuff in articles say Howard invented the Easter egg, and that is not true. Uh -huh. I perfected the Easter egg. Mm. <laughs> Excellent. I did not invent it. I think Ernest Klein brings uh -huh. that up in his book, um, Ready Player One. Absolutely. Yep. In fact, I I know Ernest Klein. He's a very cool dude. And he told me that if, in terms of dealing with the Easter egg in Ready Player One, it was down to two things. He was either going to do one of my Easter eggs or Warren Robinette's, but he went with Warren's. I think that was the right choice because Warren originated the whole thing. Sure. But the interesting thing about Easter eggs, right, is like why? Why were Easter eggs in? I mean, it's a great thing to have. It contributes to metagaming, right? It has something else to find in the game. Great treasure hunt stuff. Yep. But that's not why Easter eggs were put in there. It wasn't for player experience. The reason Easter eggs went in, the reason Warren Robinette put in created by Warren Robinette was because Atari didn't want people to know who did the games. Atari wanted every game to be an Atari game, and yep. that's it. And they did everything they could to suppress and hide uh, the names or the identities of the people who did the games. They also didn't want people poaching their engineers, right? Oh. If they knew who did what. So Warren found a way to put something in, because nobody really reviews the code. And even if they did, they're, the only people who really were able to read the code would have been other engineers who wouldn't have busted them anyway. But he put in something, and the idea was when you do your game, you put something in the game that you know about that nobody else knows about that isn't likely to be able to, to find. And the point was, suppose you go on a job interview somewhere and people go, well, what have you done? Well, I did this game for Atari. Oh, yeah, right. Anybody could say they did the game for Atari. No, no, I really did the game for Atari. Oh, yeah, right. You did the game for Atari. <laughs> Wait, I'll show you something. And then you'd have something that you could pull out that you could make happen on the screen that like your name or your initials or something that obviously no one else would put in because why was someone else going to put your name in the game? <laughs> it was like, ooh. and so it was all about paranoia and and being able to identify yourself as the maker of the game. That's what Easter eggs came, came. That's what brought Easter eggs out in the first place, and that's what all Easter eggs were. There's one in 2600 Missile Command for Rob Fulop. That's a nice one. So I wanted to put an Easter egg in, but what I I originally had one in that that people would not have accidentally, you know, fell upon. It was a very obscure. Uh, code sequence to go through and what I did though was I decided why not make it a more uh, make it more part of the, the marketing of the game so I talked to some marketing people about the idea of Easter egg because it, by this time people had found Warren's Easter egg and it was a controversy at Atari like what do you mean you guys have gone and done this what are you doing that for you shouldn't be doing that you know that violates the spirit of your employment agreement and blah 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 <laughs> yeah 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 but what I do is I talk to Mark and I said, you know, you know how excited people are about the Easter eggs? You know how cool that is? What if you could let people know there is an Easter egg in the game and challenge them to find it? You know, wouldn't that be a good sales point? And I, I got a, sale, a marketing person to agree with me about that. So what Yars Revenge had was the first marketing approved Easter egg, where now the company was in favor of it and was encouraging it and thought, okay, that's cool. We got it in the manual as the ghost of Yars. And, and as you know, like the, the Easter egg that I put in yours is HSWWSH. And the reason I have my initials there and then again backwards is to signal that you should spell things backwards in the game. And that's how you figure out that Yar and Razak is actually Ray Kazar. And, you know, so it was just a key to tell you about some of the other stuff in the game. Now, by the time I got to Raiders, I got a little more sophisticated with my signatures. So in Raiders, there's several signatures. In Raiders, because in every one of my games, you can find an HSW, and you can have, uh, and it'll be HSW with the number of the game that I'm doing. So Raiders has an HSW2 somewhere that you can find. And it also has a YAR. So there's a thing you can do in Raiders where you can get a YAR to fly out of one of the Well of Souls moments. Oh. Huh. Right? So you can actually get a That's... yard because every one of my games contains all the previous characters also. Interesting. So, 
So then when I got to E.T., I really went nuts with it. Okay. So in E.T., there's an HSW-3 you can find. There's a yar you can find in one of the wells that'll fly out of the well. There's an Indiana Jones you can find. And also, you know, there's the three phone pieces in, in E.T. Yeah. If you look carefully at the graphics for the three phone pieces, you will notice that one of them is a messed up H, one of them is a, mess, a messed up S, and the other one is a messed up W. Funny. So that's a third level of signature. And also E.T. has a J.M.D. that you can find at one point, which is for Jerome Michael Demure. So he's the first graphics designer in history to have an Easter egg in a game. That is awesome. So I actually awesome. put him in the game. So that was cool. I'm really glad we brought Jerome up tonight. Uh, Me rest too. His soul. Um, that is a really, really awesome thing to hear about. So uh, we're on to E.T. E.T., yeah, I've heard of that. I have a question. Wait. Um, did you really get invited to the London premiere of E.T.? I got invited to the London premiere of E.T. I got flown out. We got the limo ride, did the red <laughs> carpet thing. You know what's great is doing the red carpet thing when no one knows who you are. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I know what that's like. You know, and so here we are walking down the road, me and a few other Atari people, and we're walking down the carpet, and, and half the people are snapping pictures, and the other half the people are going, who is that? Is that anybody? Is that anybody? <laughs> of course you and, are. Uh, and you just act and like I ended you are. I seated three rows in front of Lady Di, Prince Charles, and Steven Spielberg. Wow. Wow. And I turned around and kind of waved at Spielberg, and you know what? He didn't know me. He didn't say anything. Who the heck's that guy? He now, was busy with Lady Di and Prince Charles. Of course. I can understand right. that. I have two questions for you related to the, the premiere. One is, do you even like the movie E.T.? I really like the movie E.T. I do. I do too. Uh, do you like it more as an adult or as a kid? I never saw it as a kid. I was, <laughs> I was, was like 23 I was well, you were four years old. When you I were first 20, saw. 24. Full your size. brain was just about done developing. I mean, you were a kid. Like, I'm talking like uh, after having years of per interpersonal relationships, does the movie have a bigger impact on you now than it did when you were young? I was on my second marriage when I saw it. <laughs> it's not like I hadn't had any relationships. I love it. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> Maybe maybe I'm maybe I'm projecting my own feelings right now. Okay. So uh, the other the other, <laughs> the other thing was as a therapist, I'd like to say <laughs> go ahead. Very interesting. Yes. <laughs> what are your rates? Uh... <laughs> very reasonable. Oh, yeah, you you know, excellent. Excellent, because I need help. <laughs> so, uh, and I've, now I've forgotten my second question regarding. Oh. oh. Um, have you had an opportunity to see the version of the film that John Williams scored live? No, but I attended a premiere that John Williams was at, and I did get to see him score live. That was interesting. Awesome. <laughs> That's not true. I want to retract that right away. But I just couldn't resist that opportunity. Well, you know, you know, you did work at Atari. We'll, we'll let it fly. So, but I would say, it, uh, it, I don't think, I, I think I've seen the latest versions of it and things like that. I mean, I, it's a wonderful movie. Yeah. It's a movie that, that really, what Spielberg is really great at is reaching inside and pulling the little kid inside of you out Absolutely. and have them cheer and get excited and roar and stuff. And it still, it did that for me the first time I saw the movie and it literally still does. I really enjoy that aspect of it. That's great. I, w I would encourage anybody who has an opportunity. <clears throat> there is a version of the film that you could get that was the 25th anniversary or something. So it's been out for a while. But they, they have a second audio track where you can listen to John Williams scoring the film live, which is just a treat because you actually hear the, the audience in the background. So they invited Drew Barrymore and everything to the second premiere for the, this big, you know, just like you went to in 82. And... Uh, and then John Williams uh, scored the whole thing live. I did hear about that. I did not attend that premiere. But <clears throat> so the you idea can... of doing a live score to the movie is kind of an amazing thing to do. Yeah, and, and you can still watch it. Just get the old DVD and 
turn on the second audio track. It's fantastic. Anyway, uh, that is a tangent. Uh, and I think, Mark, you do have this next question, right? Uh, I do. Video. <laughs> Let's see how... Let me see how I can <clears throat> word this. Video, Video games... I hear it killed the radio star. Yes. Why... I'm trying to like... So I have suggested questions, and some of them are like, I don't know. Is this a question? Do you dream about E.T.? <laughs> <laughs> Or did, or did you? you? Like, did you, you during were, when you were uh, working on it? And yeah, I thought of this. When last you time. ask a therapist, do you dream about <laughs> ET? You can get all kinds of interesting answers. That, well, what do you? What do you? Like, what exactly do you mean dream about? Do you mean ET, the character, and what are we doing together? What? Are, what is that dream about? And what's happening? Oh I mean, my god! Your, you know, I mean, let's just say while you were working those five. Oh weeks, my god. Did anything weird happen while you were sleeping? I guess. <laughs> Wait, that's not a good. Not it a good just question. got worse. Shut I don't up, know man. how it's gonna get worse. Take the hole. This is getting better and better. Pretty soon we'll have a pit that we can fall into and play. Oh, now. and we can this fall in over, over and over Mark and over and over again. In a pit. <laughs> <laughs> There is an interesting aspect of sleep and ET, though, that I would be happy to discuss. With you. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna save you here because you know I just can't bear to see you go through any more of this. Thank you. I've done this before. Now I I did work with a guy that said that you know often inspiration comes at the least likely time when you're asleep or when you're in the shower. So when you're coding. E.T., you must have had these moments where you're just like, I have five weeks to do this freaking game. How am I going to come up with a concept? And you're like... Yeah, especially when I'm sleeping in the shower. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, here's the thing. With E.T., I didn't do tremendous amount of sleeping anyway. Yeah. Right? But I did try to incorporate sleep in. What I would do is I wouldn't sleep a regular schedule. I would do I would do what Thomas Edison used to talk about doing, right? Is that you work until you're tired and then you just go to sleep and you wake up and then you go back to work. And what I would do is I would I would go to sleep either when I was too exhausted to, if I knew I couldn't think straight, I would go to sleep. Sure. But the other thing is if I was stuck, if I got to a point where I really was kind of because I was always pretty tired. So sleep was never too far away. If I got to a point where I was really stuck with something, I couldn't quite figure out a bug or an algorithm or something, I would go to sleep then because sometimes you dream up, you literally dream up solutions, right? You dream of something and, oh, my God, that's it. And there it is. Then you wake up and then you forget it by the time you get to work and that sucks. So, <laughs> yeah. But what I did was I had a development system moved into my home. So I was never far from the keyboard. So what I could do is I could go to sleep and then if I did wake up with some idea or something came to me while I was sleeping, I could run into the other room, get right on the system, and put it in and actually record it. So, so that was cool. But I, did, I didn't have an E.T. dream, but I did have one very profound video game dream once that I will never forget. And what it was, is I had this dream that I'm playing this coin-op game, and it is like the most amazing game I've ever played. It was just unbelievably fun, so clever and easy to do. And I, in the dream, I'm looking at the game and I'm thinking, okay, Howard, you've got to remember every detail of this game. You've got to remember the play, what's going on, what are the characters, what do they do? I want to completely I, I just burn this game into my mind because I knew I wanted to come back to this game. And when I woke up, I could remember everything about the dream except the details of what the game was. It was killing me. It was one of those moments of like, I had the perfect game. I had the ultimate game right there and I lost it. But the thing is, I will never know if I actually was seeing a good game or, you know, that's what dreams do. It was just a dream. And in the dream, I had the quality of knowing I was seeing a game without really seeing anything. And so dreams will, dreams will do that to you. Right. Uh, I, well, do, I do like Mr. Peabody's comment in the chat. There was a question that I like I, Mr. Peabody. Kind of well, so there's a, a running joke on the show about a, a game that is actually behind me right now called Exterminator, and Mr. Peabody asked if the perfect game was Exterminator. But the, the uh, one of the questions came up, and I thought this was actually pertinent. Was was that Billy Seven asked? Was there a particular food or staple food of your diet during the ET programming? Like, did you have something <laughs> that you just binged on? I mean, I. There was something that I binged on, but it wasn't food. 
And I, I have to say that uh, Exterminator may not be the ultimate game, but it's the only game I know that has no bugs. <laughs> oh, well, it has oh, lots of bugs. Oh, like you couldn't see that coming. Oh, it has so many. <laughs> I, you That's know, what you get for having me on the program, <laughs> that, is, that is such a perfect comment you know, to this season. Because exter- so. Adam hates this game. It's at my house. Well, I hate even more that it's it. mentioned on every episode. But I, you know, one of the funny things is Carla Maninsky that's, loved your jokes, and that's not a good one. That was a great one. <laughs> well, that's the thing about my jokes is the opinions vary. <laughs> Depends okay. on who you are. We've hit yeah. 9 o'clock. I want to – Howard, you can stay with us for a little bit longer, right? I can, Absolutely. And, and we'll, uh, okay, so we're going to continue the interview, but we have a drawing right now. All right. Mr. Mark Shields. Well, there are 17 entries. They are all valid. Okay. Am, am I doing the drawing? Or I'm doing we, the drawing. You're doing the drawing. Yep. So, yeah, so we're drawing for three our, uh, cartridges, a set of E.T., Indiana Jones, or I guess I should say Raiders of the Lost Ark. So the top name course, will get... A Howard Scott Warshaw, Once Upon Atari, signed DVD. DVD. We will arrange right. for that. Howard, you and I will talk after the show. Absolutely. Uh, and so, then, so it's actually two drawings, I guess. Yep. So we're going we're gonna to draw two names out of the hat. The top two names will win. The first one gets a DVD. The second one gets the, the trifecta of Howard Scott Warshaw cartridges. Very cool. All right. One more drawing and you'll have a gallery. <laughs> <laughs> yep see, there's see? A Howard see these are really good i mean okay all right here comes here comes the drawing the computer is running oh can oh, you hear Eddie's it computer i can all right and we are gonna Good. no whammies no whammies stop okay ryan edwards wins the dvd tonight Oh, right, Ryan. Really? Yep. Ryan Edwards nice wins work. the DVD, the signed DVD. We will arrange that uh, with Howard, and he will send it to you uh, directly. So we will work with it, work that out with him. And then also, uh, the second winner is, believe it or not, longtime listener and friend of the show, Billy Seven. All Billy right. Seven. Ah. He is taking About home. Time he won something. <laughs> the trifecta Billy Seven doesn't get a mail. Billy has to come over to Adam's house. That's funny thing because uh, I do have another prize of his that I did not mail out uh, because I, I would rather just see him and yes. and we can social distance and wear masks and he can take this. So, um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, uh, congratulations to our two winners tonight. And if you'd like to know who Here was you. close tonight, DJ Norman, Mr. Peabody, and Necros were the closest. I just love telling people they didn't win. Oh, nobody so likes close. that. So <laughs> close. Mr. Peabody missed it Losers. by Sherman. Oh, <laughs> he sorry. did. He said, <laughs> set the Wayback Machine for... <laughs> That's it. I love that show. The whole I did, Jay too. Ward thing, Rocky and Bullwinkle. Oh, what a great show that Dudley was. Dudley Do-Right. Oh. I mean... It was, and the... Fractured Fairy Tales. Yes. Thank God for reruns because we would have never seen those. And you know what? You don't get that today. You don't get reruns. You just don't get them. You really don't. You have to find the uh, classic TV channels. Yeah, it's true. Well, and there is a couple locally. So uh, I want to say thanks for ever to everybody for sticking with us tonight. Keep your questions coming in the chat because we're going to let ask them. And we've got Howard Scott Warshaw for a few more minutes tonight. So uh, again, thanks for being on the show tonight and. Uh, Mark, let's let's kick off another round of interview questions. I think we're in the ET section now. But maybe you should uh, let me let me let me uh, let me kick us off because there's one thing that I've always I always thought that the ET the legend of the ET cartridges being buried in the desert was an urban legend and nothing more. That was what I thought. And uh, I would like to get your your summary and thoughts on that because. Uh, when I saw that uh, the documentary um, Atari Game Over, which is is uh, is worth watching, I, w- I would say um, I was shocked that they actually found the dig, you know, or had the dig and found the cartridges. 
So what was your reaction, first of all? And, and give us a little background on that. Well, I mean, there was that that urban legend. And for many, many years, you know, people would ask me about that. And I would always say, you know, nah, it's ridiculous. You know, why would a company that's hemorrhaging money mm -hmm. spend all the extra money it takes to, to, to truck, you know, just incredible volumes of worthless material out into the middle of a desert and bury it and run tractors over it and pour concrete over it? Yeah, we know with Teamsters and stuff like that. That's a lot of money. Why would you spend money to get rid of something that's supposedly worthless, so worthless you want to throw it away anyway? Right. That never made any sense to me. So I always assumed it was ridiculous because it didn't make sense. But as I said, when you expect things to make sense, you're losing touch with the tar. <laughs> because, oh. Because at, and I was shocked. I mean, I went out there to the dig myself. You know, they flew me out there for the whole thing. I was part of the movie, and. I was thinking, you know, there isn't going to be anything out here because this is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. But I was thinking, I really hope I'm wrong because this movie, if they don't find anything, is going to be incredibly lame. <laughs> and so and I thought I'd rather it was a good movie since I'm going to be in it. And so I figured this would help it. And uh, and then when they came up, it was uh, it was actually a very surprising moment for me. It was a very touching moment because what happened in that moment was I looked around and there were literally hundreds of people. Now you got a picture that this is this is in a garbage dump in the middle of a desert in like just out in the middle of nowhere in, in New Mexico. No nothing against Alamogordo, but this is not a major metropolitan area. <laughs> this is like a very small town in a very way out in the middle of nowhere. And we're sitting there, but there are hundreds of people there. And when we when we drove up in the morning to approach there, there was a line of hundreds of people standing to waiting to get into a garbage dump. What's the last time you saw a line of people waiting to get into a garbage dump? Never. Right? And every and it, there was a sandstorm that was blowing the whole day. I mean, it was really a rough day. And the idea that all these people braved all this stuff for all these hours, and then finally. Here's the game. They actually find the games. And they come up out of the ground. And I'm looking around, and everybody's so excited. And all of this stuff is going on. There's cameras going and all of this stuff going on. And honestly, I was overwhelmed. I was overwhelmed because in that moment, what I realized <clears throat> was that this little thing that I did, this you know, 8K of code, of assembler code, that I did over 30 years earlier, had generated all of this excitement and all of this attention and and here it is paying off and people are so happy and stuff and i thought oh my god you know i always looked at video games as a broadcast medium i mean that's just the way i see video games that's one of the yeah. ways i see video games and you know you're doing media right here this is sure. broadcast media you know why do we do broadcast media right it's on one level to inform mm -hmm. hopefully to entertain yes and and ideally, I think, to generate social discourse, right? I mean, there's a really successful piece of media. Anything that does all three things, yeah. that's a really successful piece of media. And here it was. I was seeing it right here. I was seeing that 30 years after I produced this piece of media, it's still creating attention. It's still creating excitement. And people are here and they're enjoying themselves. And I felt so good, okay, that I really had really killed myself, not literally, but I mean, really put myself out to make this thing happen. And here it was still creating this kind of excitement and this kind of interest. And it was just overwhelming for me. I was just, it just meant so much to me to feel that something I'd done had this kind of impact. It was uh, so cool to see all these people in their faces and then just do like all the autographs I had to do after that to sign all <laughs> the stuff that they had brought, which was very interesting. But it was, it was a huge moment. And it was interesting. And then there was the real big discovery of the whole thing. I hate to bust the whole movie Atari game over, but if people haven't seen it, you know, spoiler alert. But the truth is, it wasn't just ET cartridges that were buried, right? It was a whole warehouse that had been emptied. So every one of my games was there. It wasn't just about ET. It was about emptying some warehouse so they could repurpose it for something else. And so it was like, it was one of these things. It was the urban legend that was right for the wrong reasons which yeah. is kind of an interesting uh, resolution of the whole thing.
It's interesting because you know I uh, it again I never expected that urban legend to come true, but I I was watching uh, the toys that made us recently, mm. and there's a there's a section on Mattel, and, and uh, you know the Good woman show. the woman who invented Barbie, and who was the CEO. Uh, buried a bunch of Hot Wheels cars in the in, in a dump, uh, and wrote them off as delivered to customers, and what? was subsequently arrested <laughs> and thrown in yeah, jail. Yeah, it doesn't always go as nicely as it did for me with ET. <laughs> but it, all, it was it was not just Hot Wheels. Apparently, there were some dump trucks in there too. <laughs> 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 oh, I have four quick sick hit questions, and I say sick hit because I was in the bathroom when I thought of them. Okay, so here we go. <laughs> All right. At Atari, and, and these are going to be quick ones, did anybody ever crawl through the ceiling tiles? How about that? Yes. Todd what? Fry. I was going to say, if anyone was going to do it, it would be Todd Fry because he was walking the walls and he hit his head on that spigot. I mean, that guy is the one exactly. guy. The sprinkler lobotomy. By the that way, he's the one that programmed both Pac-Man. In the Once Upon Atari DVD and my upcoming Once Upon Atari book. That guy's awesome. Uh, he reminds me a little bit of uh, there's a character in Chuck. Uh, what's his name? The Burnout. Anyway, uh, it's neither here nor there. So yeah, uh, Todd Fry. Next yeah. quick hit question: What car did you drive when you worked at Atari, and would you describe it as badass? Uh. Hmm. Uh, I drove a Camaro. At first, at first, when I started at Atari, I was driving like a Datsun B210. But after my first decent check came in, I was driving a Camaro Z28. I would not drive describe it as badass. I would describe it as kickass. Kickass. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, because back then it, there was no badass. It was kickass. That's. I guess it was. Although the car you see in the Once Upon Atari DVD was not that car. This was a, a, a an RX-7 that I had later. Oh. But it had the same license plate, the Via Tia license plate, that I did have on the Z28. Because I had that license plate for many, many years. I almost, Via Tia. I almost died in an RX-7. Oh, man. Wow. In 1992, a buddy of mine had an RX-7. And I was riding shotgun. And uh, he decided to pass a car on an uphill outside corner. Oh. And we came wow. around the car to find another oncoming car coming right at, right at us. He whipped the wheel. We did a full 720. Whoa. And then we landed going the same direction we were on the right side of the road. <sighs> I got out of the oh, car wow. and I literally kissed the ground. I was like, we almost died. <laughs> what happened to the shotgun? Stuff. Yeah, I think I swallowed it. Oh, man. Probably a good choice in that moment. <laughs> okay, my last quick hit question. Mm -hmm. uh, did you run a BBS or did you know anyone that ran a BBS in the 80s? I did not run a BBS. I knew some people who ran a BBS occasionally, but I, I didn't know any that really got much note. Right. So that's a that's a dead end story. Well, then my backup question, in case that one <laughs> fell flat, is that were there Please. any were there any secret offices at Atari, and was there cool stuff inside Whoa. like snacks? <laughs> secret well, on some level every office at atari was secret because there was always something going on behind closed doors at atari uh, <laughs> that was there but in terms of snacks you know it was wherever you found it you'd never know where something was going to turn <laughs> up as long as you could get you know get to the snack before the mice did but so did you uh okay describe on that note describe the most bizarre atari meeting that you remember Wow, that's tough because there's a lot to choose from. <laughs> one, I'll, I'll tell you one of the coolest types of meetings there was. When I got there, there was there was a thing called MRBs, and they would have like announcements occasionally. It's MRB in such and such a place, or MRB up there on the roof, or MRB over in someone's office. And I came to find out that MRB were the initials for Marijuana Review Board. <laughs> and so, oh. they go, MRB is so and so that meant somebody had a joint and they were going to go smoke it with some cronies 
And uh, <laughs> although the strangest meeting venue was probably when I first got to Atari, it was at a place called 1272 uh, Gibraltar. Okay. No, it was 1272 Boregas. Oh. And uh, which was right on the corner of Boregas and Gibraltar. Okay. And we were on the second floor and there was a ladies room. There was the men's room and the ladies room, which were on either side of the elevator. But the ladies room, you would see men coming in and out of the ladies room on a semi-regular basis. And I didn't really understand that, <laughs> except for there was also, you would see a little billow of smoke occasionally come out when people would do that. <laughs> so it turned out, that, like the men's room, you know, you go through the men's room door and you are in the men's room. It's just, that's right. the bathroom, there you are. In the women's room, there was an ante room, right? There was like a little lounge room on the way to the bathroom. Sure. So when you went through that door to the ladies' room, you weren't in the ladies' bathroom proper. There was yet another door you'd go through to get to the ladies' bathroom, which I did not see any men go through or come back out sure. of. But in that lounge, that was a very popular place to smoke, which wasn't necessarily fair to any uh, women who didn't care to have a smoke. Right, right. Way, the restroom, <laughs> but there were other restrooms for that also. But uh, so that was kind of interesting that there was this, you know, there was the ladies' room on the second floor at two seven at twelve seventy two, and that was pretty much all about uh, the smoking lab. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, do you have any more in the can here for us, gentlemen? I know well, you got I a hard stop we'll... coming up here, Howard. Well, no, so yeah, I'm turning into a pumpkin soon. But go ahead, Brian. Well, actually, it was a question from one of the chatters, and you kind of alluded to Yars uh, potentially being ported, but did you ever have an interest in an arc like doing an arcade game instead of a, a console game? Billy Seven wanted to know that. Oh, not really. Not really. I liked doing the console games. I didn't want to do an arcade game. What I wanted to do, I never wanted to do a conversion of an arcade game to the mm -hmm. console. What I liked doing was original games. So movie licenses for me were perfect because a movie license gave you the chance to do an original game, but it also had a license behind it that would push the sales. So to me, that was like the ideal thing, although the royalty was much higher on an original game. So Yars was judged an original game because it deviated enough from the coin op and I took it in another direction. So, so I did one original game and two licenses, and then I had another original game coming up which was Saboteur. A lot of people don't know it, but I actually did four games for Atari. Only three were released. Actually, all four were released, but Saboteur wasn't released until 2004, so it was actually 20 years later. It is on the retro stick, you know, the Atari retro joystick? Oh, that yeah. came out that had all the games. If you look at that stick, it has Yars Revenge, but I believe it also has Saboteur. And the Saboteur game was revived. It was It's my unfinished symphony, right? Because... It was I, I was doing this as an original action game. This was my return to action gaming. It was a multi-screener with some really cool action in it, I think. And uh, But it, it didn't get released, and then Atari kind of blew up, and it just sort of sat there. And then at one point, uh, Al Russo was uh, uh, key involved. He's with Atari Age. He was uh, involved in, in picking up that code somewhere, and just you know, basically finishing it off, repackaging it, and getting it out. That's the only one of my games that doesn't have signatures in it, but it does have Yars in it. Oh, cool. So you can see Yars is one of the characters that's running around on the first screen. That's so awesome. it does have a link back to my other games, but I didn't, I didn't get far enough with that game to put... The signatures were the last thing I'd put into a game. I never felt good about doing signatures before I was just about done with the game, because I didn't want a signature to have taken away from the quality of the development of the game. Well, I know we've got a hard stop coming up, so I want to kind of round up here. Uh, why don't, Howard, why don't you give us, uh, first of all, onceaboutatari.com if you want the DVD. Uh, uh, send him a little message, uh, get your PayPal going, and he'll he'll sign that and send it out to you. Uh, but, I will hook you up. But tell us about your book and uh, when that's coming out. Okay, so I'm in the process of finishing a book. The book title is Once Upon Atari, How I Made History by Killing an Industry. <laughs> Which is you know, all I could, my only claim to fame. And so it was, uh, it's about all the experiences, some of the things we talked about tonight, a lot more we didn't get to, uh, about what life at Atari was like, what life was like beyond Atari for me, what life was like before Atari for me. 
fact, it's a lot about me, and, and Atari's in there, too. <laughs> And uh, and it, all the way up through the dig, through the, the dig and the making of the Atari Game Over movie and all the things that happened through that. It, if, you, if you thought I was fun to listen to tonight, you will absolutely love the book. Oh, cool. If you didn't really enjoy listening to me tonight, <laughs> you might like the book, but the odds are different. Oh. All right. Well, we'll link you to stick with us for a couple minutes after the show. Uh, we're just going to sign off here, but uh, if you have any advice for, or, or uh, you know, if you want to plug anything else, now is your time, Howard, uh, and, and then we'll kick it off. Well, I'll tell you this. I am a psychotherapist who practices in California. I'm licensed in California. And the thing about becoming a therapist is very interesting for me because I specialize in high tech uh, leaders and the super intelligent, or another way to put it is I work very very, very thoroughly with nerds <laughs> and people and the people who are trying to love them. And it's mm -hmm. very significant for me because what it means is that what I used to do at Atari was entertain nerds. Yeah. And now I actually work to make their lives better. So I feel I've come full circle in a lot of ways in a way that I'm very proud to be of service. So thank you very much for having me on. Adam Absolutely. and Brian and Mark it was really a pleasure talking with all of you. I'd be happy to do it again if the need arises. But to thank you so much for having me. It was really, it was a pleasure being had. Most of W, A team, this is us. We're going out. And I think uh, the best thing to do is take your pants off. Right? <laughs> what? Pretty sure that's what happens. Oh. All right, thanks for listening to Double R's. That's Arcade Radio. Hey, don't forget to check out Old School Gamer Magazine. You can pick up a subscription at www.oldschoolgamermagazine.com. Oh, some of you may have received that magazine in your last thing of gifts. Also, check I out our website, radio.com. That, that's arcaderadio.com. That's R-C-A-D-R-A-D-I-O.com. You know, we got all kinds of links on there. You can check it out. Hey, call and leave comments on the game line, 612-548-GAME. That is 4263 in case you can't spell. <laughs> Enjoying the show? Pick up some Arcade Radio swag over at teespring slash arcade radio or consider supporting our Patreon campaign over at patreon.com slash arcade radio. Multiple tiers starting at just $3 a month. Any bit helps us with the cost of running the show. Hey, while you're here, subscribe to our YouTube channel and click that notification bell so you will know when we're streaming live when we go live with our Season 5 premiere. <laughs> and if you like what you're hearing, drop us a review, hopefully five stars, on Anchor, iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you consume our podcast. But it's currently up to date, all the way up to Warren Davis. That's going to be it for the show and the season. Adam is actually giving us some unpaid vacation from the Arcade <laughs> Radio team. We hope you had a blast and we'll see you next season. <laughs> yeah! We awkwardly, we awkwardly danced to Adam's music. Do the Batusi. Not <laughs> That's it, boys. That was season four. Yeah.